Well, tonight uh, we're going to answer a question that came uh, from an online listener. They sent on this question, and this was a genuine question. I believe this was a really heartfelt question that they asked. They says, why doesn't faith produce miracles today? And this is how he phrased it. He said, Brother Scott, what does it truly mean to have faith? And he went on to say, what are we missing today from our lives that keeps us from performing the works of the apostles and healing in Christ's name? I can hear the, the concern here in this man's voice. Or, or ladies, I can't remember which one it was, to be honest. Uh, Jesus talked about, he says, how the faith the size of a mustard seed could accomplish great things. And he says, I take that literally. What does it mean to truly have faith in God? What is true faith and where have we lost our way? These are things that weigh on my heart heavily. Well, when I heard the, the concern and the idea of the miracle that he's looking for, it made me think of a recent incident. And I don't know if you've heard about this, but there was this family and this church in Redding, California. And they made the decision uh, to pray for the resurrection of a little two-year-old girl who had passed away. Um, and the article about this said they had been praying for the resurrection of that little girl. It transitioned, though, into a memorial service to celebrate the young girl's life. Um, the article said a Facebook post by the Bethel Church on Friday acknowledges an outpouring of prayers hasn't brought Olive, uh, and, and I don't know if I can pronounce her last name, it looks like Healingathal, but I'm not sure, uh, back to life. A press release from the church says that the girl's parents, Andrew and Callie, are now planning the service. Olive had died on December the 14th when she just suddenly stopped breathing. And since that day, church members and others turned to prayer, music, and song on the girl's behalf. And this is what they said in that post. Here is where we are. Olive hasn't been raised. The breakthrough we saw it hasn't come. And the church said the, uh, the girl's sudden death, the Bethel community in Reading, and around the world had been hoping to revive her. They had a hashtag called hashtag wake up Olive uh, that went across, uh, across the world according to them. And they said, we've sought this miracle from God to raise her from the dead. We realize this is out of the norm, but that's what a miracle is. It's outside the box of nature and our power. And it went on to say, when you are a friend of God and know that he is your heavenly father, you trust him and ask for big outlandish miracles. Well, can I tell you something? I fully expect that Olive will rise from the dead. I fully expect it. There's no doubt in my mind that Olive will raise the dead. Matter of fact, I believe every grave around is going to burst open one of these days. Everybody's going to come back from the dead. Some to uh, everlasting shame and then some to everlasting glory is what the scripture says, right? Some to heaven and some to hell for their eternal home. Actually, the lake of fire, all of hell will be turned into the lake of fire is what uh, the scripture says. And I have no doubt she'll rise in the resurrection. And I don't believe uh, that these people didn't have enough faith to raise the dead was the reason. I believe that it just wasn't God's plan right now. If God wanted to, he could have raised that young girl from the dead. But that wasn't God's plan, was it? It wasn't his plan. Do you believe God could raise somebody from the dead? I hope you do. That's the only reason you're a Christian. You know what I'm saying? That's the only reason you're a Christian is because you do believe that Jesus Christ rose from the dead, right? He rose from the dead. That is, in Romans 10, 9 and 10, that is one of the qualifying things that says you're a Christian. You believe in the resurrection. You believe Jesus rose from the dead. But he's not going to do it right on your cues, you understand. It wasn't part of his plan that that would occur. Should we ask God? To raise people from the dead? I can't say that I haven't asked God to raise people from the dead. I can't say I haven't asked that. Now, I didn't put on a big show and 
find out how many people I could get to run a hashtag for it to happen. I didn't do all of that, but I have prayed when I saw family members dead, that God just raised them from the dead right now, right? But it wasn't in his plan. It wasn't in his purpose. It wasn't the time for that. Tonight, I want to look at another parent who needed help for his child. And it's the same passage that this question came from, the passage that talks about faith as a mustard seed. Before we look at the passage, I just want us to be reminded of this. It's in Matthew 17, if you want to turn there. I'm going to have it show up here in a minute. But Matthew 17, 19 through 21. A mustard seed is the very smallest seed uh, that there is. Now, there are other seeds, they say, that might be a little bit smaller in this part of the world there. But it, the point is, unless you're getting all the specifics of that, it's a very small amount. A little tiny seed will grow this great big old plant that comes out of it, right? Something very, very small can grow. And that God, that's what God's telling us about, about our faith here in Matthew 17. And, and the miracles that can come out of just a little bit of faith, just a small amount, if you're just willing to have just a little bit of faith, the problem is I don't think many of us even have a mustard seed. Maybe we've got a half a mustard seed sometimes that God will step in and, and do something or, or react in some way. Let me tell you what, and I, I'm kind of jumping ahead, there's miracles happen all the time, folks. There are miracles that happen all the time. You just got to be willing to see them. But here in this scripture, uh, then came the disciples to Jesus apart and said, why could not we cast him out? Well, let me give you a little background here. There was this man who brought his son and there, he was uh, being, uh, had this, the devil had a hold of this young boy and he was being controlled. He had literally taken possession of this young boy's life. So much so that when he was near the fire, the devil would take him and try to throw him in the fire so that he'd burn up and die. Do you believe that happens? Yeah, I do. I do believe something like that can happen. So this boy, uh, this was happening to him. He was called a, a lunatic. And the idea, you know, we think lunatic, we think just crazy, right? The idea here, that word luna, refers to that means that he was moonstruck. So he was kind of moonstruck crazy. Uh, they believed that the moon come out and he just kind of it made it even worse. What happened to this boy? There was something happened to him that they just could not understand. But Jesus' uh, his disciples go up and they could not cast this one out. Jesus told them that they could cast these, these demons out. But they could not cast him out. And so Jesus said to them, because of your unbelief, for verily I say unto you, if ye have faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye shall say unto this mountain, remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. Howbeit this kind goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting. And if you have some of the modern Bibles, they cut out fasting. Um, but I don't think they should. <laughs> I'll just tell you that. By prayer and fasting. So what happens in prayer and fasting? When you fast, you don't eat. You set everything else aside to focus on God, right? And you might do that with uh, social media. You might set your computer aside in this day and age just to focus on God. There's lots of ways that someone could fast from something. So your mind is completely set upon God, and you're down to the Lord, and you're in prayer, he says. He says this kind doesn't go out except by this. So Christ is saying here we must seek God diligently. There's times that we really need to seek him hard and seek him strong because we need him in that situation, right? We need to find him. And, but this wasn't to see a child raised from the dead, though, was it? Was it? This child was possessed of a demon. Possessed of a demon. He was dead spiritually. For a demon cannot possess a saved individual. Oh, they can't all press. Can I tell you what? I've got some demons. I... They probably, they know my name, they follow me around, they oppress me quite often, all right? But they don't possess me because I'm a child of the king. The Holy Spirit's in my heart and ain't no other spirit can get on in there. You understand what I'm saying? I, I'm made new in Christ. But Jesus is saying here, 
He is comparing seeing this boy's life change, seeing him cast out the evil spirit, receive the Holy Spirit. That's like moving a mountain. And ain't nobody I've ever seen move a mountain, right? Just say, hey, get mountain, how about you get up and he walks over here a little bit, right? We don't see those things occur, do we? But God says, Jesus says here, that if we were to find an individual and they were to come and we were to share the gospel with them and they'd be mightily changed by the power of God that the evil spirits be cast out from them and the Holy Spirit come to live inside of them, he says that's the biggest miracle you can possibly imagine. Right? Yet you look at it that way. Oh, we get a few crying eyes, we get a few claps, we get kind of excited when somebody gets saved. We go to work and we might mention something about it if we're extra spiritual. But do we realize we've seen a miracle uh, in the account of moving mountains that occurred when somebody got saved? Do we realize that? See, this boy's life was comparable to that. Nobody thought it was possible. It's not possible to pick up a mountain movement. The boy being set free from the devil's grip was comparable to that, according to Jesus. I really think that we need to consider in our own hearts what are really great things in God's eyes, right? I can put on the finest show up here. We can have uh, lights and we can have a magic show and we can show all sorts of amazing things that might occur, right? But God says that's, that's not a miracle. That's not anything. He says that soul being saved, that's the miracle. It doesn't have to be someone brought back to physical life. Uh, we say miracles. God says acts of incredible love and faith that really move mountains. Real Christianity lived out in the world is a true miracle. It truly is. If you saw what this what, what place was like 2,000 years ago, you'd be shocked by what we're living in today, right? I mean, it's a lot better than it was back then, okay? Because Jesus come into the world. Uh, there simply is no rational explanation, though, for true Christianity when it's real. Um, faith, if it have not works, is dead, according to James. A real belief in Christ will cause a person to become a new creature in Christ that loves as Christ loves. Listen to this. For by grace are ye saved through faith, is what Ephesians 2 says, and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God. That's a miracle. Not of works, lest any man should boast about it. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. An alcoholic became a believer. And somebody come up and asked him, said, Buddy, can you really believe in all them crazy miracles that are in the Bible? And he said, Well, yeah, I believe them, I do. He said, you don't really believe that Jesus turned water into wine, do you? He says, well, of course I do, because he turned liquor into furniture at my house. Huh? Made all the difference. He changed. He saw the miracle there. He knew where his life was, and he knew what he had become, and he looked at that and saw the miracle, the miracle. We are saved by God's grace, and we will do good work since we are now in Jesus. Those who are saved... And God isn't working through them to do good works, though. There's no miracle that's occurred. This is what James says in James chapter 2. He says, What does it profit, my brethren, though a man say he have faith and have not works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled. Notwithstanding, you give them not those things which are needful to the body, what doth it profit? This is where we try to take the miracle today. We say, well, if you say something, then you're saved. And we don't doubt that until we see the fruit of that, right? Because some people say they have faith, and they might have a little faith. Well, I'll try God out and see how he works. That ain't how it works. You don't try him on like a, like a code or something and see if he fits for you. You receive him, and he makes you into a new creature. And that new creature loves other people. You won't leave them like this here. You won't see your brother or sister naked and destitute of not having any food and say, well, be warm and filled, but I don't give you anything, you know. That's not real faith, you understand? 
That's not real faith because real faith produces that mir those miracle miraculous. That's a good word, isn't it? Those miraculous works within you that you change your attitude, you change your ways. Goes on to say, even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. Yea, a man may say, thou hast faith and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Do you know what? The devil absolutely believes that Jesus rose from the grave. Amen. He does. He has no doubt, even saying that, I, he believes that Jesus rose from the grave. But that's not saving faith. What is saving faith? I believe Jesus rose from the grave, and that makes a difference in me. Amen. You understand? I'm different than I was before. Oh, I'm not perfect. But I'm working toward what he wants me to be. I am becoming uh, in the image of him. Before I was in the image of old Adam, right? But now I am growing into the image of Christ. And my goodness, if we always take that on, imagine the miraculous things that would occur all around us, right? We'd see all sorts of mountains being moved. We'd see all sorts of people going from sinner to saint, wouldn't we? We'd see people coming out of those things because we reach out and we ask God diligently for their salvation, right? We would be different and changed. It goes on to say in James, and it gives us the example of Abraham. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Seest thou how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled which said, Abraham believed God and it was imputed unto him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. You've got a real relationship with God if you believe him, if you've got real saving faith. It's a real relationship. You're his friend. He's your friend. There's a difference there. You see then how that by works a man is justified not by faith only. Likewise also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she had received the messengers and had sent them out another way? There was this old harlot down in, in, uh, in, in Jericho. And they came in and they met with her. And out of all the people in there, that she allowed them to come in and she hid those spies for a time. She had faith in the God of Israel instead of the God everybody else was serving within that city. You understand? And that made a difference. She was willing to risk her life follow that God. Even though she was once a harlot. Can I tell you what a harlot is? A prostitute. Right? She was running a whorehouse. We make it plain. And yet she had faith in God and that made her different. It made her different that she stepped away from that. You understand? You understand? You think that ain't a miracle? To have some old woman running a whorehouse, come to Jesus Christ and have faith? Would you go up and shake her hand? She come in the church. Would you welcome her gladly? I, I believe you would. I hope you would. If you didn't, you might ought to go see if you can find out how to get your mountain moved. All right? Because that's the way it is. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. You say, well, Scott, everybody's always telling me just have faith. Only if you read Ephesians 2, 8, and 10, you see that God brings those good works out of you by grace through faith. You'll be changed. You'll be different. Uh, so it's, it, that's how it is. These are great works and these are miracles. This is something I think it's especially important when we think about the miracles that God does. C.S. Lewis said this. He says, God seems to do nothing of himself which he can possibly delegate to his creatures. He commands us to do slowly and blunderingly what he could do perfectly in the twinkling of an eye. If God wanted to see your unsaved individual here, he could, uh, he could warp them in here. Just, he could beam them up Scotty and have them sitting right here today if he wanted to. I'm sure that'd be a crazy miracle. You know, he does that in the Bible. He took old Philip and he transported him from one area to another, didn't he? He wants to do it. He can do anything he wants. But he's chose to use you. 
He's chosen to use your hands and your feet to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Say, boy, it'd be a whole lot easier if he'd just go out there himself and do it. He'd just show up in the sky and begin preaching. My goodness, people would come to him. You think? You think? But he chose to use you to go talk to him. He chose to use you to go do those miracles of moving mountains in people's lives. There is another point about these supernatural, uh, some would say miracles too. They don't happen every day, do they? They wouldn't be a miracle if they did, would they? They wouldn't. So look for the so-called everyday miracles. But don't forget, God can still do the non-everyday miracles and make sure you let God let you, or you let God let you be a miracle for others as well. Because folks, that's what the whole Christian life is all about. If you think about it, it's one big life of miracles from the moment you're saved. It truly is. It truly is. I hope you're enjoying the sermons here and have subscribed to my channel on YouTube. But I would love even more to meet with you in person at the church where I'm blessed to pastor at in White Pine, Tennessee, Omega Baptist Church. We are a Bible-believing church called to love all people without bias by proclaiming and teaching the Word of God through the power of the Holy Spirit. We are located directly off of Exit 4 off of Interstate 81 in Tennessee. You can see us clearly from the interstate. We have worship each Sunday at 1030 and I hope you'll make plans to join us. It's all about Jesus, my friend, and we pray that we may be able to have the opportunity to share with you personally the life-changing gospel of Jesus Christ.